Today, we're going to focus on what it means to represent a data set and starting with images in particular. And what we're trying to do is build some intuition on how machine learning is able to learn what it is that is in a data set and what it can't learn and what problems it runs into as it learns. Uh, so we're going to start to see how we can model and learn an entire image data set so that in the future we may also generate things from that data set. And we're going to do that by slowly learning the components and like teasing out the bits and pieces that make that data set representative of that data. So what's, what is representative and what is interesting about that data? And these are things that are hard to define, but we'll start to see what that means for some of the algorithms we'll be exploring in the coming weeks. Um, and just to kind of contextualize it, remind you like the reason that we're creating this model of a data set is so that that model can be used as digital material, as our paint, our palettes, our wax and acrylic that we get to move around and use as we wish. And so we're, we're starting on this journey with the basics. And we'll take a short tour through some of the work to get us to where machine learning is today. Um, but for now, we're still focusing and learning on the basics to build that intuition. And um, part of that basic um, uh, technique comes from statistics. So it's in like 1880s, we're talking about statistics that learned to model the mean of a distribution. And so I'm going to give you some intuition on what that looks like in terms of an image data set based on what's been done in the past. Um, so jumping to the 1980s, there's Nancy Burson, um, who worked with MIT scientists in this work called Androgyny and um, used it as a method for somehow predicting the future as it's written, at least. And um, this is, you know, two decades before digital photography was really ubiquitous. Um, but working with MIT, they developed this technology to composite images of different faces. And uh, they worked with the FBI as well. Um, so this is in 1982 and had it supposedly used it for um, finding missing people. There's a famous case in uh, 1985 of, of a six-year-old Eaton Pats that appeared on the front page of the New York Post. Um, and so she says of the goal of this composite, of the composite was that it was to help readers stop and think when it comes to similarities between um, two different people. So that's interesting, right? 1985, this was being done um, with digital images, um, probably like SGI, some early systems for, um, for computing basically and image formats even. Uh, jump to the 1990s, we've got uh, a work which was an, an amalgamation, a print work um, by Justin Sullivan who took uh, Playboy centerfolds from 1988 to 1997 and uh, averaged them using this SGI uh, file format. And he, he investigated a lot of <clears throat> different um, averaging techniques and different data sets, let's say, <clears throat> didn't really call them data sets, but different uh, collections of images. You know, it wasn't for the purpose of machine learning, it was really um, an investigation of the data, I suppose, or the collection. So this was a different angle. Um, I don't know if Justin Sullivan was thinking about um, bias in, in doing this work or not, but it's certainly one question that we're going to think about as we create these image data sets. So yeah, this is overly red maybe on my monitor. I don't know what it looks like to you, but it should probably be more yellowish, uh, goldish color, I'm not sure. Um, jumping a little bit forward or back, or I'm not entirely sure, I guess this was 97, this was 94. So this would have actually happened before. So this is um, 
seminal work in cognitive sciences by Shins and Oliva and um, working in MIT. They had uh, their, their research paradigm was on visual cognition, how we understand the visual world and how scene processing in humans work. And so they have the question of what is it that we as humans first understand when we, if we were to somehow just like be born into existence and look out out of a window, what is the first thing that we interpret out of that window? So this research tried to ask that question by saying, I'm going to take a normal scene of a city skyline on the left and on the right um, image of traffic and I'm going to process it so that <clears throat> I have only low spatial frequencies or high spatial frequencies. So on the bottom here, we see low spatial frequency and on the top, we see high spatial frequency. Um, what that means is um, essentially the, the way in which the image has been combined or filtered preserves uh, edges that happen over a longer period of time. So the low spatial frequencies try to resemble the coarser information, the edges that occur over much longer frequencies. And then at the top, we see the high spatial frequencies, the rapid changes in information across space, the high spatial frequency content. And um, image averages are a way of preserving low spatial frequency content. They based on the filtering methods and techniques, what ends up happening is that you actually lose all the high spatial frequency information. But it turns out that humans um, really understand low spatial frequency content very quickly. And uh, it led to this whole paradigm of research and in what's called GIST. And uh, you can look it up, um, like 20 years of visual cognition research is kind of built on this work in order to understand why is it that we understand low spatial frequency content right away and it takes us much longer to understand the high spatial frequency content. There's even a whole time course of understanding this information, like 80 milliseconds, you will understand what happened in front of you just based on its low spatial frequency content. So anyway, moving along, um, 2000s, we have now um, Antonio Taralba, also at MIT, is, um, happens to be the partner of the researcher that um, worked on this, Ode Oliva. Uh, here, he has worked on a image averaging of a very popular, at that time, um, uh, data set for images. And there are 101 different categories. You might be able to perhaps guess what the first category is. And um, here he's really trying to investigate the representation of a data set by averaging each object as its mean. And these, these sort of data sets were used, you know, up like, I forget when Caltech 101 was created, I think not too long before that, maybe 2001. Um, oh, it was 2003, 2003 as well by Stanford now Stanford researcher, Fei Fei Li. And um, there are about 40 to 800 images of each category. And you can see right away kind of where perhaps there are biases or misrepresentations or kind of only one type of representation for certain categories. So this is a really interesting technique, I think as a first introspection to any data set. It's often the first thing that any machine learning researcher will do is look at the mean of the data, especially with large data sets. Um, it's very time consuming and often impractical to look at every single piece of data in your data set. And so this is one technique to try and understand like what is, what is in my terabyte data set you know, um, try to calculate the mean and see, oh, you know, I have a whole bunch of stop signs, for instance, or, you know, my category of faces have primarily white males. Um, maybe that's an issue, right? Uh, let's see. 
moving on. Here we have another uh, image average by Taralba again in 2003. Um, rather than objects, uh, he was also working on scene perception, which is um, you know the overall image scene, not just like a particular object that might appear in a scene. And uh, here he's taken a collection of um, street scenes. There's not many details on this, so I don't know how many images there were, but it does reveal an interesting bias on um, street scenes that generally there is a pedestrian focused in the middle of this image um, across the collection of images that he, he picked at least. But that's pretty interesting. As well, you can sort of make out the landscape and the color of the street versus the sky and the kind of trees perhaps along the uh, street. There have been a lot of interesting problems like this of trying to understand um, representations that might identify a type of scene um, just based on averages. And uh, Travel worked on this again in 2006 as well. Um, there's a lot of research between 2003 and 2006 on this. Um, where he's more or less looking at this idea of the gist of a scene or the the average of a particular type of scene and starting to question like are these things that we've learned like as humans have we figured out that that you know this is an ocean somehow like i just probably guess that that's an ocean but you know why how how have i learned that so there's some perhaps some you know, high up in our visual cortex, some sort of uh, scene recognition component that uh, has learned these um, sort of biases within types of scenes. Um, that's interesting, I think. Uh, again, on GIST, you know, they, I won't, I won't actually go into this, but you can read about this. There's, there's a lot more work on the cognitive science side of this. Like if you squint your eyes, you will really just kind of perceive the low spatial frequency information um, sort of things, fun tricks there that really interrogate the uh, visual system in fun ways. Let's see. Um, then here in 2008, we have Blair Neal working on a video art piece and the reason I wanted to show this was more about like how how is it that we can understand what is in a data set. Um, often machine learning people just won't even look at the data. They will go straight to the models, you know, and they'll build a generative algorithm on it, or they'll build a classifier that learns to distinguish people or whatnot. And um, a big issue with machine learning that people are trying to understand is like, well, you know. How do we make these things more explainable? How do we interpret what's happening better? Like, why is that algorithm biased or uh, unethical? Like, what what happened? What went wrong? And uh, the first place to look is really the data, and most people just don't look at the data. So I think this piece in particular is interesting because it's it's not about machine learning. It's just a video art piece that. Um, Blair and Neil wanted to look at all of the different products that had ever been like needed or conceived, marketed, shipped, stocked, whatever. And uh, he just like went into store after store until he got kicked out and like kept taking photos um, and then created a really rapid serial montage of all the different images that he collected. Um, you can check the video online as well. Uh, I don't have it on the slide, but um, search for this 10,000 items or less, and you'll see that. Um, two years later, we have Kyle McDonald looking at that same data set. Uh, so Blair Neal released the data set online, and then Kyle's looking at the representations of these different types of products now by looking at the averages, much like what um, Travel had done, right, with the uh, the Caltech data set, but, but for totally different purposes, right? So interesting, um, really interesting work. And this is on his Flickr, you can check that out. Um, so Nancy Burson, fast forward now, 2014, 
you know, she was looking at composites in 20, I'm sorry, 1982. And now here we are in 2014, she has um, a solo exhibition of different composites that she's um, worked on in the late 70s and 80s. And these are of different uh, computer generated composite portraits. You can check these out online. Uh, another one perhaps worth mentioning, we have Tralba again working now just two years ago on looking at the averages of images for different elements in the periodic table when querying Google image search with that element name. And he's printed these on wooden cubes. And yeah, this isn't really averaging, but I wanted to throw this in here just because I think it's fun. Um, this was in 2018, Nancy Burson again, uh, invited to work on the cover of the Time magazine. And she's done a face morphing between Trump and Putin. And um, this uses many other techniques like PCA and eigenfaces perhaps related, but more like face swapping, face morphine and first order motion models which we'll um, get more intuition into in the later lectures. Right, and then another Taralba piece, he's, he's printed, I think again, wood blocks, uh, different GPS locations around the world and then printed this as a map. And then this one I literally just saw about half an hour ago when I was on Instagram, <laughs> this was, this just came up in my feed. I have no idea like how this came up, but um, yeah, you have the average uh, politician, uh, different um, parts of the US Congress and Senate there. So that's just a kind of cultural tour of what has been done in the realm of image averaging and um, now we're going to step into the techniques and uh, again that will kind of form our basis for understanding machine learning in the next weeks. So a recap, um, hopefully most people in this class as digital media artists are familiar with digital image representations, but you probably haven't had to think about digital image representation at this low a level. So images are composed of pixels and they have shapes. Um, I like to think of images as having shapes, as at least. Um, they have shapes of height, you know, going on the vertical axis, the number of rows is the, the height. Then you have width, the number of columns. And for a color image, you have RGB, right? You have three channels that get mixed um, and composited to form the illusion of this color image. Right. So you have, um, you know, for this tiny slice of the whiskers here, you've got this array of pixels and there's a shape. They go in order of height, width, and then channels. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see how this comes into play in a bit um, once we step into this lab. But keep this in mind, the shapes of images uh, of one image here is a height by width by channels representation. And if we start to look at a whole data set, really what we're going to end up doing is create another dimension where we just have the number of images. So rather than have um, only, where's my mouse? Oops, I don't get a mouse. So rather than have height, width, and then channels, we're going to stack up many images. Maybe I have a hundred images of tigers and it's just another dimension, right? I get to store a hundred images of tigers if I have a hundred images of them and uh, I'll have a, a shape of that image that will look like this. And that's a data set. That's what we're going to try and build is this, this type of tensor is what's called um, a higher dimensional uh, array effectively. So Google Colab is a um, Google Colab is a application provided by Google 
and it hosts what are called notebooks. So if you go to collab.research.google.com, you should see something like this. You might have to do something else. Let me know if you don't see this and you're concerned, but it should be somewhat easy to get to a screen like this um, by typing in collab.research.google.com. You should be signed in on your Google account and uh, you can create notebooks. So I will create a new notebook and uh, it's given a name up here entitled eight, which you can change. I can call this uh, DMA session uh, two and then WIP for just work in progress. And then it's got this weird extension on the end, which is IPy notebook. Um, and this comes from the fact that Google Colab is actually built on open source software that used to be called, that is still called IPython. And um, many people still use that as well. So this is basically a hosted version provided by Google of a tool called um, IPython Notebook, which also confusingly got later renamed Jupyter Notebook. So if you've heard of any of those things, this is effectively what we're working on right now. Um, so I'm going to be copying and working from a version of today's lab that I've already completed, and I'll provide that to you um, after this class. So don't feel like you have to keep up and type everything as you watch this lecture. Um, but do try and play with some of the commands um, and try to get some intuition for it. Just don't feel like you have to um, be up to speed with it. Um, go back to the lectures and follow along the uh, more in-depth version of this notebook that I will host for you. Welcome to Google Colab or Jupyter Notebook, whatever you want to call it. It's the uh, hosted version of a Jupyter Notebook effectively. What that means is that this is running on a computer somewhere. It's a virtual computer hosted by Google, and you can actually run programs on this computer, just like you would most other computers. It's going to be a Linux machine, um, which don't feel intimidated by Linux. It's just uh, another type of OS. It's more like uh, running terminal commands on your Mac, if you've ever done that. Uh, First thing that we're going to do is connect this to a runtime. And you'll see here the on the top right corner, connect to hosted runtime. What this means is uh, there's now going to be a program that is interpreting everything that we write into this notebook. And that program is Python. So Python is now interpreting what we write into this uh, notebook. So I can write um, into what these things are called cells. I can start writing code in here. Uh, if you hover to the top middle part of the cell, you'll see some plus signs that allow you to create other types of cells. So on top of this, I could create a text cell and then I can write text in here. And there's formatting allowed. Um, I can write markdown in here as well. Like I can say, this is introduction to collab and write text in here. And so after I've written this text, um, I can execute it. And this is going to be a typical paradigm within Jupyter Notebooks or Google Colabs. You'll write text into a cell or code into a cell, and then you will hit the buttons um, shift and enter. And what that does is it um, executes that cell, but it also moves the cell to the next one. So if I hit shift enter here at the same time, it will go to the next cell and have executed that. So it's formatted that text for me. Um, so as I mentioned, these are containers for code. These are notebooks. They they show this sort of like thought process of developing programs. They can be 
you know, pedagogical tools like we're, we're using now, they can really be explanatory kind of thought processes of code snippets and how you work with different types of codes. Um, the notebook itself isn't infinite, like it's not going to just run forever. You know, I had to connect to this notebook and say, connect to this runtime. And that's actually costs Google money to run this computer somewhere. And so they're not just going to leave it running forever, right? Um, so if you close your laptop or computer and, or browser and try to come back to this page, uh, there's a good chance that, you know, the outputs that you've seen here um, while running this notebook will be gone and you have to redo it. And we'll see what that looks like in a bit, um, in a bit. but um, there are ways to kind of work with this environment that are less frustrating. Um, but it can be really frustrating for that reason. Like this is being hosted somewhere else. It's not on your computer. So at some point it will get shut off. Um, the code itself, the text um, itself, that will remain. That's being auto-saved constantly, and you'll see it up here, all changes saved. But um, as we start executing code, you'll see that um, there's a bit more going on here. So I can write any, anything that Python understands, I can write into a code cell. So Python understands math. I can say four times two, it will tell me it's eight. And I hit shift enter there and it automatically executes that cell and creates a new cell right after that. I can create variables. I can call my variables most you know, things, whatever I'd like. I can set that to whatever I want. Um, or my variable probably is more explanatory. And uh, you know, I can see what the output of that is. I've got autocomplete. I've got even the autocomplete for the previous variable that I mistakenly created called my variables. And that's interesting because, you know, you don't actually see it here, but there is a variable called my variables. Uh, what you do see on the each of these cells is the order of which that cell was executed. So I see the number one here and then the number three here. And that's basically telling you um, which cell was executed from the start of a runtime. So I can ask Python to print out any of my variables by just saying the name of the variable and it will say two here. Um, if I disconnect this runtime or I lose connection and I have to reconnect to this notebook, I will see all of this output and the code, but in place of this one, three, and four, there will be empty brackets, meaning that the code wasn't um, executed. And I won't actually have my variable in the runtime. I'll have to re-execute the entire notebook. Uh, so one way you can do that is by saying runtime run all that will actually just run everything in the notebook. Okay. There are a lot of things that you can set to a variable in Python, like you can say my variable equals a string. So that is also acceptable. You can also ask Python, like, what is, what is this variable? Like, what kind of variable is it? Um, and you can do that by saying underscore, underscore, class, underscore, underscore. Yeah, is this okay text size and size wise? So I can um, ask any variable for this really hidden um, property called class, and it will say that's a string, str, short for string. I can also ask, what is the type of a variable? And this is all like really introductory Python stuff. I'm just kind of going over it. I don't think that we'll really ever use these things, but it's helpful to know how to maneuver in Python if you're unfamiliar with it, I think. 
Um, you can write if statements in Python. Uh, if my variable equals two, then I can print. So I can print like in many other languages, I would say it is equal to two. Else, print um, it is not equal to two. That will execute, and because my variable was equal to something, it's not equal to two, right? So one thing that always tripped me up when I first started working with notebooks was the order of what you see is not the order of the code that was executed. The order of which the the order of execution is written down in each cell, right? Like I've got one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight here. So what happens to this if statement if I execute this cell right here? My variable would get set to two. And so if I re-execute this cell, then it is equal to two and I'll get this as output rather than this. So let's try it. And at the eighth cells at execution, it's not, my variable is not equal to two, it's equal to something, the string something. I'm going to now go back to the top of this notebook, hit shift enter. My variable is now equal to two. I'm going to re-execute this cell it's going to ask, are you equal to two? And it is equal to two, right? So that's just kind of showing the order of which things happen in notebooks is up to you. It's not like set in stone, right? <clears throat> that can be really confusing, I think. All right. Um, so another thing that we can do is actually run commands on the operating system. So far, we've been typing Python commands. These have been running on the uh, runtime, which is Python itself, which we connected to. But Python itself is actually running on a Linux machine, which we can also run commands on. So just like your OS is running Google Chrome uh, or whatever is running I mean, you know, your notebook, and you can run other programs, right? So I can ask the virtual machine, which is running Python, I want to run other programs as well. And in order to do that, you use this exclamation point, and that will say, run a command outside of Python. You know, I can ask it um, to list all the files and this is a Linux command, I can ask it to list all the files in the directory. Or I can ask it what version of Python are, is being run, and that will tell me the version. So these are all um, Linux commands effectively, right? I can ask it how much disk space is there? DF is a Linux command for um, measuring how much space is on each disk. And the dash H just means a human readable format. And this is a Linux command that I've just run, and it's putting all that information. Uh, also on Linux, there's a tool for finding help about most tools, most command line tools. It's called um, man, short for manual. And you can ask it for things like, what is this DF program? How does that work? And it will spit out like way too much information about it, uh, which can sometimes be helpful if you're trying to figure out uh, a Linux command line application that can be helpful. But uh, hopefully you won't have to use this too much. It's just, uh, you know, it is there for you. Um, most of these things I always have to just Google, like, you know, there's just endless tools on Linux and often a Google, like how do I find out how much disk space there is on Linux? And you'll find some Stack Overflow that says run this command and that'll tell you. Um, let's see, some commands actually work in Python with or without the exclamation point. So like 
ls was one, right, that lists how many, what files are in the directory, but that actually also works in Python. Um, pwd is another one, which is print working directory. So this is basically saying I'm in the path forward slash content, and inside of that folder, there's actually another folder called sample data. Um, in Colab, you'll see this kind of sidebar here, and it will also provide a file browser. So you can actually see the same thing here. I'm in this some folder. Um, if I go up a folder, then I'll see like, oh, there's all of these folders on this machine. And I'm working inside this folder called content. And this is like the rest of the Linux operating system basically here. Don't know what I did there. Um, right, yeah, there's there's a lot to go into there, but I don't think we need to look at most of that. <clears throat> so you you know you can navigate um, notebooks by pressing J or K to go up or down. You can also use the up and down arrows to do that. And yeah. Let's take a look now at importing libraries. So when you're, when you start Python, it's um, mostly like a blank slate. There's a lot of like standard libraries that come included in Python that allow you to run these commands like ls, pwd, other things like that. Um, but just like other libraries, like in um, Java, you import libraries, right? You can write import and then the name of a library that Python has access to. And so there's many libraries that this version of Python, which is hosted on Google Colab, has access to. Let's say like one is called requests, which allows you to um, perform requests, uh, HTTP requests, things like that. You can ask for help for any library. So you can say like, what, what's going on inside of this library? Like, what can I do? And you'll get a whole bunch of information depending on the library, this would be more useful or not. Um, but for instance, you can use this library to get a website and then look at its content. You can also run a post request, so sending data to a website that accepts post requests and that might return some value. This is a pretty useful package for when you're um, working with scraping data from a website, things like that. Uh, let's see. So if you want to see all the packages that Python has available to it, you can ask the Linux operating system, like, hey, what's, what are all the uh, libraries that are installed? And you do that using this command called pip. Um, so I'm asking the OS pip, this is a um, Python tool, and I'm going to say list. And then here are all the libraries that come installed on Google Colab. And there's tons, you know, like there's, there's usually not a reason to install anything. It comes with most of the libraries that you would probably need uh, for this course. You can also install things on the Linux operating system. So we've just seen how to uh, import a library with Python. Um, but what if you want to actually install software on the machine that this um, tool is running on? You can do that. Uh, the way that you install software in Linux is using this command line tool called apt, apt-get, and you can install things. Um, so let's say, you know, I search Google, like, how do I Linux, how do I um, parse movies with the CLI? I don't know if this is something you'd ever search for. Linux, uh, 
do I convert a movie to images? And then there'll be this thing about FFmpeg. There's some command line tool for FFmpeg. Okay, so Linux, how do I install FFmpeg? Uh, Ubuntu, this is the type of um, Linux operating system that Colab is running on. And it will say all these commands about running apt update and then apt install FFmpeg. <clears throat> we don't have to run update and we don't have to use the sudo command. Um, but we basically will just write this command apt install FFmpeg or equivalently apt get install FFmpeg. They both will, will work. And it's already installed as it turns out. But if there were other Linux software that you have to install or felt like you needed to install, you can you can do that using this, this type of command. Okay. So there's one Python package that we're going to install that um, I had written for another course actually. I'm uh, going to install it. It's called CADL, C A D L. Here, the dash Q just means quiet. I don't want to see all this output, and um, it would just be a lot of output otherwise. <clears throat> There's an error, but it's fine. It, it's not really an error. OK, so that's now done. The cell is executed. And what that means is I can import that library now. Great, that worked. And then you know I can ask for help for that library, like what's going on in here. And um, this is. This has a lot of things inside of it. We're not actually going to look at most of this, but there's this one utilities <clears throat> module, which is helpful for images that we're going to be using. So after I've imported this, um, I can also import things from this library in, in another way. Um, I can say from that library import one of its sub modules is what's called. And all the modules are listed here. The one that I want to actually import is called utils. Um, so this is the one that will install it on the OS. And um, these two aren't actually required. But then this one is the one that will, you actually need. From, from that library, import this submodule called utils. So that's executed. Um, inside of this library, there's a function which we're going to use. And this is um, get celeb files. All that this is doing is um, going to download a bunch of files for us. So I don't have to um, think about downloading my own data set right now. This will actually download a data set for me. Um, and then we'll look at some other ways of creating data sets following this. But um, one of the things that you can do in Python, which I find really, really clever and helpful, in IPython at least, is um, you can hit these, um, you can ask a question of any function or module in general, and it will do the same thing as help that thing. So instead of saying, you know, help this uh, function, I could also say utils.get celeb files and then question mark. And that will pop up the same information. <clears throat> Except now it's um, kind of just sits here until I get rid of it, which is useful. So there's this function that says it's going to download the first 100 images of the celeb data set. 
and then it will put it into this folder if one doesn't exist. So like many other um, languages, I run a function by using this open close parenthesis notation. And that will actually run the function if I execute the cell. So this is now downloaded 100 files inside of this folder, image align sled A with these file names that have all been printed out. I can kind of confirm that if I look inside of this folder and then inside there, I'll see the 100 files, right? And in Colab, you can actually visualize images as well. So I can double click on an image and let will just draw it here on the side for me. And I can open up any of these. So what is this data set that we've just downloaded? It is um, a fairly popular data set called Image Celeb Aligned. Uh, the celeb A, this is the data set right here. Uh, there's a lot more images in this data set. I've only downloaded 100 of the images, um, but this is a really popular data set that's used for modeling faces, used for facial recognition, used for modeling facial expressions and like things like that. Um, maybe you've come across it and uh, certain artists have used this data set quite a lot. If any artist you've seen has worked on modeling faces, they use this data set more than likely. Okay, um, so this is just a kind of quick wrapper to let, let us get a hundred of these images quite quickly. And what if I wanted to know what that function actually did? Like, you know, I'd, I want to look inside this function. How can I do that? Uh, with the single question mark, we got help, right? We saw the um, what's called the doc string, the, the help part of that function. But if I use two question marks, I'll actually just get to see the entire function. So this will show me the same information of the doc string, but it'll also show me all the code. And I, I love this part of Python. It's it's probably its best feature in my in my opinion. Like you can just look inside anything and um, try to figure out like what is that? How did that work? And uh, you can try to interrogate how things uh, work and try to learn uh, from that as well. So that that's one way to um, get more help about something. All right, uh, let's see. Let's take a look at something else now. We've seen uh, a bit about the kind of Python syntax and basics. Uh, one of the things that you're going to have to do for your, mm, your homework is that you're going to have to create an image data set. And you're not going to be able to use this function that already exists out there, right? Like you're going to have to actually get your own files into this uh, notebook environment. So that means you'll have to download files from the internet or you'll have to upload the files into this virtual machine, which is running Linux. Um, or there's a third way, which is actually mounting a Google Drive onto the same machine that this um, Python notebook is running. So I'm going to look at all three of these ways, downloading files, uploading files and mounting a Google Drive. Uh, so before we imported this library called requests and um, the code for doing that was just import requests. And when we looked at the help for requests, it actually gave us an example of running requests. So it said you can um, get a website by running this function called get after you've imported the request module. So let's say um, 
on Twitter and I see this image and I'm like, okay, cool. I want to download that. Um, you can do that. This is a link that I've just pasted and oh, I've lost connection. That's fine. So what just happened? My disconnect, my runtime just disconnected, which can happen because you know that's why the service is free. Uh, one of the reasons, at least. Um, so if I try to run the cell, oh, it's still running. Okay, good. So there's a chance that that wouldn't have worked, and I would have had to actually run all the cells again, or at least the ones that this cell was dependent on. Um, I would have had to re-import the utils module, uh, but then the utils module wouldn't have existed without the cattle module. So I would have had to also run the command to install the cattle module, right? Or more simply just run every single cell uh, using this function here, run all. So that can happen and it will happen. Uh, so that's how you get around that. All right, so we've got this requests module and um, we've seen in the help function, you can Google as well, like, you know, Python requests download image. And then there'll be, you know, some stack overflow here that says you can use this code and then copy and paste that code and try and figure out what they're talking about. And there'll be some good answers and some bad answers, you know, um, many different ways of doing this, basically. Uh, I'm going to show you one way as well, that's probably not in that stack overflow. Um, so this is a URL that I just got from Twitter. I don't even remember what this image is. Um, but what I'm going to do is set that equal to a variable just like I had my variable equals one plus one. Now I've got res for result, short for result, um, equal to whatever this function does. So I have hit shift enter, this cell has executed. Now I've got a variable called res and I have no idea what res is or what it does because I've never used this module before. Um, but I look online and I find that bit of code or I look at, you know, my hosted version of this collab and I see that there's this thing called content inside of this variable. And that's actually the raw bytes of that request that was returned from that image. And in Python, you can write files. You can create a file of any type. You want to create a file using the syntax that you probably haven't seen in any other language, um, but it's going to say with, and then this function open, which is going to create a um, file. I'm going to call it result.png. I'm going to write binary bytes into this, um, I'm going to write bytes into this file. And that's going to create a uh, variable called whatever I want, in this case, fp for file pointer. And what I can do is I can write into that file um, the content that I just downloaded. So this is a pretty tricky bit of code if you've never seen this, um, but it's a pretty popular paradigm in Python that you might see. Uh, writing to a file is often, it often looks like this. All right, so that will have created a file called result.png in the working directory. And in my file browser, I can see that there's a new file that was just created. And if I double click on that, I will see what this random Twitter image was, which is, I still don't remember looking at this, but that's, that's what that URL is. So if I've got a list of hundreds of images, then I know I can download them using this bit of code right here. And I can download them to a file that I call you know, result.png or result whatever. 
or my favorite image one.png you know um, this is one way of downloading uh, content into this notebook and getting access to it all right another way of getting files into this ecosystem this um, notebook is you can actually upload a file into it so you, you can use the file browser and upload a file and you can do that right here uh, upload to session storage this is tiny um, text that you probably can't read but you can upload a file so if i had already downloaded a file i could just go and upload it and it'll appear right there right that's another way so you could even upload a zip file that has all of your images in it. And that will be another way to get all of your files all at once. And then you can unzip the file um, using code or using a Linux tool that knows how to unzip files. OK. You can also write code to upload a file. So in the same way that this button functions, you can actually write code. So you can say, from the Python package google.colab, import files, which is a module. And then inside of this module, um, there's a function called uh, upload. And that will return some files as bytes. And I can set that equal to something. So if I run this, I will get the option to choose a file to upload. That will write it to this byte uh, variable, which I could write to a file, just like the request module work. So that is another way. I, you know, totally up to you how you want to work with these different options. The recommended way that I prefer and suggest you do is none of these. These are all, you know, more like if you want to script something or do something a little more advanced, um, the way that I would recommend getting files into this notebook environment is mounting a Google Drive. And there's a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is if this runtime disconnects, you have to redo all this download upload stuff, right? You have to redo all of that. And maybe it took a long time to download 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 images. It might probably took a long time, right? And this is a temporary computer that you're connected to. Like this file result.png is going to be gone tomorrow. It won't be there tomorrow. <laughs> so you have to rerun the code in order for it to be there. So if you mount a Google Drive, Google Drive is basically like a Dropbox hosted by Google, right? It'll still be there tomorrow. Whatever you put in your Google Drive is still going to be there. So that's why I would suggest using a Google Drive. And you can mount your Google Drive by saying from google.colab import drive and then drive.mount and then the location to mount it. So we're in this folder called content right now, slash content. And then I'm just going to give it a subfolder. I'm going to call it drive. And it's going to ask me to go to this URL to authenticate. And that's how it, you know, handles all the permission stuff. And then, you know, which account do I want to mount to? Okay, I've got this account, one of the 12. And it's going to give me some code to paste back into the Google Colab where I just ran that command that popped up in this browser. And I can hit this copy button. It'll automatically copy all that stuff. And then I'm just going to paste it into this tiny box here. And that should do something useful. Mounted at content drive. And I should see that pop up here in a second, or I can force the refresh. So now I've got a 
folder in here called drive. And uh, this is a persistent drive. You know, this is all the stuff in my Google Drive, a lot of private stuff that I shouldn't show you in here, but like there's stuff in there, right? And if I write a file to that location, like if I were to have written this result, um, this image to my drive by saying, I want to write it to content drive, my drive result, then that image would appear in this folder, which is actually my Google Drive. And that would be persistent so that the next time I run this notebook, I just have to remount my Google Drive, <clears throat> but I don't have to re-download that image. So far, we've seen a bit of the kind of syntax of Python and working with the underlying operating system that is running Python, the Linux operating system. Um, we've also seen how to get data into this uh, operating system, this virtual machine. And we've seen how to download an image using the request module or uploading files. And we've also seen how to mount a Google Drive, which is my preferred and recommended way of um, dealing with external files uh, on this hosted notebook. So we're going to move on to working with images. Um, as I mentioned, the homework for you um, due Tuesday will be to uh, create an image data set, as well as a couple other things that we're going to get into. I'm trying not to scare you right away, but um, we will be creating image averages like we've seen in the um, slides earlier. So there's a lot of ways to work with images in Python. Like it's, it's a mess, uh, to be honest, but there's like one way that I feel like I've figured out and I just like that way and I'll be showing you that way, um, but there are many other ways. Uh, and I think in general, people that work with machine learning use this particular way, I would, I would guess. Um, so we're going to be using two libraries in particular. Um, <clears throat> one of them is called NumPy. Um, so we can import that library and there's already an autocomplete that says to import it as NP, which is just, you know, I'm going to import the library NumPy, but I'm actually going to call it NP because that's less characters to type. That's all that that's saying. Um, so I can access that module by saying NP dot, and then I get everything that that module has. The other library, um, that we're going to be using is matplotlib. And this is what we'll be using for loading images as well as saving images and drawing images. And so you can import matplotlib's um, submodule. You know, confusingly enough, this is, there's a submodule in here that we're going to be working with. And we're going to call that plt, just because, again, that's shorter than pyplot. Um, these two commands are so like frequent and so useful that there's actually a shorthand for this. And it's um, using this thing called a magic function. And so we've seen how to run Python commands. We've seen how to run OS commands. But then there's even yet another weird third class of commands. And these are called magic commands. And you probably never really run any other magic command except for this one. Um, but they're ways of interacting with the notebook server directly. So not Python, not OS, but the thing in between the two, which is the notebook server. And um, we run magic commands by running this uh, ampersand. And then you'll see that there's a lot of different magic commands, right? Um, but the one that we're going to use is called PyLab. And then we're actually going to give it an argument, um, which is the type of PyLab that we're going to set up. So, and this is PyLab inline. And you'll see that it's, it's just done these two things for us, as well as a couple other things that are really useful. Um, 
I won't go into those details now, but I did write about it on the um, version of this document that I will give you. Okay, so, you know, before I downloaded all these images, right, I've got 100 images here. Um, so far, we've just seen how to look at it on Google Colab, but how do I get, you know, my code to look at it? So I can load an image and set it equal to a variable um, using this function called imread. So inside matplotlib, there's a function called imread. And you'll see the auto, um, uh, what's it called? The, you know, the pop-up will tell me the syntax is a uh, file name and then a format. I can also use this other help function and that will tell me the same information with more detail. Uh, but basically what we want to give this is a file name. So what, which file do I want to load? So I'll give it the path to a file. And I've got 100 images in here, so I can just pick any of these. I think that's the right number of zeros, maybe. And I'll set this equal to a variable, right? Now I've got a variable called image, right? What does that mean? What is it? Um, I can ask its type, like, what is it? What are you? It's a NumPy MD array. So that's that other library that we imported. Um, this is generally the format that we work with in machine learning. Um, it's a an array, you know, it's a, like that image that I sh showed you on the slides. It has a shape. I can ask for its shape, you know, like what are its dimensions? So it's got rows by columns by dimensions or height by width by the number of color channels. This is a color image with three channels. Maybe you'll download an image that has four channels and the fourth channel is an alpha channel. Um, and so you'll have to remove that alpha channel or deal with it at some point. Uh, this doesn't have an alpha channel, um, but it is 218 by 178 pixels wide. <clears throat> so let's see how can we draw it. Um, we could use this function called I am show and that will take an, as its first parameter a variable to draw and then it has all these other options which are have defaults. So whenever you see on this function signature in Python equal to something already that's basically saying you don't have to provide something for that. There's already a default for it. Okay, so that's the first image that we saw here, right? Same file that we just loaded. All good so far. Okay, then on the um, version that I give you that you can download, I go into some more options on like the style of this plot, like how you can change the style. Um, I won't go into that now. You can also save an image. So even though this is, you know, the exact same image, I can actually, you know, save any, anything that represents an image. So that has this shape, um, I can save that as an image. So I can run just like I wrote, I am read, you know, what do you think the function is to save an image? Plot that I am saved, right? And we can give it a file name. So the first parameter is a string, um, where to store the file. I'll say, you know, saved image and give it an extension and then the array that represents the image. So that's um, going to save right here. And I've got the same image right here again. Okay. 
I should have a little bit of a different image. Let's see what other images are in here. Image 10. Let's see what image 10 is. Okay, well, you know, this is the data set that we've loaded. Okay, well, I don't know. I'm just having fun now. Let's see. Uh, so we can take a look at the directory. If like this wasn't open, we can also see that that file is actually here, it's saved image, right? This is um, Linux syntax. We can also say ls-l, and that gives us a bit more information about the, each file that was listed. And we can see exactly how many bytes was that image. This is often useful. Um, you can also do ls-lh, and that means like give me a human readable version of that because I don't know what that means, but somehow 88k is more human readable. Um, so that's the image that it just saved. Let's take a look at um, an issue that you'll probably run into creating a data set, which is cropping and resizing images. So if you remember from our slide deck, I mentioned that we're going to have to create an array of say 100 images of this shape. Uh, but you know, not all images that I'm going to put in my data set will be this shape. So how do I get them all to look like one shape so I can then average them, right? I don't know how to average images of many different sizes. That's seems to be really complicated. Um, but I can average <coughs> anything that has the same shape. Um, and we'll see how to do that. Uh, but first we need to get all of our images to look like the same shape. So I mentioned that these NumPy arrays all have a shape. This one is 218 by 178 with three color channels. Um, Inside of that cattle module, which I already imported, um, just a reminder, I imported it by saying from cattle import tills. Inside of that module, there is a function called improp to square, which is like image prop to square. And that just means like whatever image I give you, prop it to a square. Um, this is, this will be useful basically. Uh, <clears throat> So if I give it that image, whichever image, and set the result into a variable, that image will now be a cropped image. So it's determined you know, that the height needed to be cropped to match the um, width. And I can look at the resulting image. And Compared to this image, it's uh, it's gotten rid of a bit of the top and a bit of the bottom, so it's it's centrally cropping the image. Is what it's doing. Okay. Um, now that I have the image as a square, I can also resize the image. So let's say uh, if I want to resize, I'm going to use this other package uh, called SK image. And so it's already installed. I don't have to pip install it, but I can say from that library SK image, <coughs> there's a sub uh, module called transform. Inside of there, there's a function called resize. And so this is how we're going to resize our images. And I can look at the help for that. And it says, as its first argument, give it an image. As its second argument, give it an output shape. And the first argument should be a NumPy array. And the output shape needs to be a tuple or an ND array. Uh, so a tuple is basically a Python thing, which has this open close um, parenthesis with any number of um, elements in it. So we know 
uh, this is a tuple as well, just for reference. Um, so a shape can be represented by this tuple. So if I, if I run this function resize on my image, my cropped image, and then give it a new shape as a tuple, let's say 256 by 256, set that equal to um, a new variable, and that will be my uh, resized image. And I can look at that. Great, yeah. So the sequence of operations that I've done to this image were I've cropped it to a square, and then I've um, resized it. And if I do that same set of operations to any image, I know I can get it to be the exact size that I want. Um, sorry, that will print out the whole array. I can get it to look like this shape. So if I've got a 1020 by 900 pixel image, I'll crop that to a square. <clears throat> That'll give me 900 by 900. And then I can resize that to my fixed size of 256 by 256. And um, I can do that for practically any image now. And so I know I can standardize any image to a particular size uh, by using that crop to square and then resize. Let's move on to <clears throat> image types. So this is a pretty murky topic. And what it's about is the representation of each pixel value. So I know that there are 256 by 256 pixels, and there are three color channels for each pixel representing R, G, and B. But what is each value? Like what, what are those numbers? And um, you might have seen before when I just typed the name of the variable and then hit the cell, a bunch of numbers appeared, right? So these are the individual pixel values. RGB, RGB, RGB for every single column and then every single row. Uh, that's what we're looking at. And these are floating point values. So if I ask my um, <clears throat> NumPy array, what is your type? You can, you can ask it by saying D type. This will, this will say like, what is the representation of every number that you store. It's going to say it's a float, right? Um, if you use other libraries, other image libraries, you might load an image and it might end up being another type, um, which will make things complicated when you start combining mean images or if things don't look quite like they do in this notebook, that's one of the things to look for is check the image type. Yeah, a, a little bit more about this topic is the, the range of values. So uh, you might load a, you know, originally when we loaded this image, its type was actually uint8. You know? So when I asked plot.imread way up here to load an image, it loaded it as a different type. It loaded it at what's called an unsigned integer with eight bits. And if I look at the values of this image, they're not floating points. They are all integers that are unsigned, meaning that there's no negative value and zero and all the positive numbers. Um, so zero uh, to 255. Why 255? Because it's eight bits. And eight bits just means that there are eight, two to the eight possible values, which is 256. Um, so zero, including that's zero to 255. Those are all the possible values that every pixel can take. And when we called this um, resize function, it actually 
did a fun thing and just decided to convert our images to floating point for us. So that's, that's a little tricky and nuanced and um, just something to look for, I think. We can also convert our images to floating point right away. So, you know, as soon as you call plot.imread, um, that will return you this uint8 image, but then you can also just convert it to a 32-bit image. So I could say image divided by 255, and that's still an image. That's still the same representation as my 8-bit image, but now as a floating point image, except that floating point image is a lot more useful for practically everything that we want to do. It's just a lot more information, right? Instead of 8 bits of information for every pixel, now we've got 64 or 32 or some you know, much more amount of data. Um, so in general, I recommend when you run this function I am read, you give it a file name, check the D type, check what type is it. Is it uint8? Most likely, yes. Um, most images are going to be stored as that format. Um, then convert it to a floating point in order to work with the, the things that we're going to look at in this course. And you do that by dividing it by 255. Okay, um, and that's in the notebook as well that I'll give you a bit more about that. Image dimensions next. Okay, so we've seen the shape of an image. Uh, resized image is square, 256 by 256. It's got three color channels. Um, what if for some reason I had a four channel image? You know, like I might download an RGBA image, which has an alpha channel. That can happen. Um, or let's say I want actually a grayscale image data set. I don't want color channels, but one of my images is color channels. How can I convert that image to a grayscale? Um, assuming you wanted to do this all in Python, you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> so you can um, slice your images. So this image is, uh, can be indexed with the square brackets. And I can say, give me every single row using this colon operator. That just says like, I want all of the rows. Uh, I could even ask for some of the rows, like I want rows 32 to 100. You know, you could do that as well if you want. Um, but this is just saying, give me every row, uh, give me every column. And then I can ask for just one of the um, channels here. Or if I had an RGB8 image, I could say, give me all of the channels up to uh, and excluding the third channel. So this would be zero, one, two. So this would be just the zeroth channel. And I can take a look at what that looks like. Matplotlib knows how to draw single channel images as well. And it does this fun thing where it draws grayscale images using color maps. There are a lot of different color maps. Um, there's a link in the notebook I'll give you. Uh, but there's actually a parameter that you can give I am show. It's the very second one that's documented, um, CMAP. And uh, CMAP takes a color map. Uh, color maps are part of this plot module under CN. And then there's a whole bunch of color maps. Um, one of them is the grayscale color map. So that will actually draw this as like a, a luminance image. You know. Okay. So we've done a lot with just one image, but you know, we actually have to load up a lot more images to deal with the data set. How, how can we load up all of our images? 
Uh, we're going to use another library. It's the glob library, which is a, you know, like a, a string syntax, I think. That's accurate. Um, so I know inside of my folder here, image align underscore celeb A, uh, there's a bunch of files with a particular name. Um, they all happen to end in JPEGs. Um, so I can actually ask Python for all of the files in this folder using what's called a glob string. Um, and so glob has another function which is called glob right? and it takes a glob string which is you might have seen this but maybe not known that this is what at least python programmers call it um, it takes some syntax that matches a um, a set of matches and so this this asterisk is um, a glob uh, Part of the glob string is basically saying, give me all of the JPEG images that match this um, uh, in this folder. That's a, an example of a glob string. If I didn't know the names of the folders or I had like many folders with image underscore, I could put another asterisk there. It just, it just means like match anything. And so I could set this equal to files and um, that will give me every file as a string that matches that uh, glob string. So I can take a look at what happened here. I've got a list. This is the syntax for a list in Python, as well as many strings inside of that list. I can index any of these. Um, I can index a list by saying, give me the zero element in that list. Um, that will also work. I can ask for the last element by reverse indexing, so the negative one in value. I can also see how many did it load by asking it its length, so there were 100 files. Uh, I can also write a loop over these files. So I can write a loop over anything in Python that um, knows how to generate elements from itself. So in files, there are individual strings. Um, and this is the syntax for a variable, which I give the name for, for each element in files. I can call this whatever I want. For i in files, for element, I usually use l for elements of a uh, list. And I could print each element if I want, as an example. So I've got every string now output as this uh, loop. I can do other things inside of this loop, like um, print and yay, I don't know. We'll get that output in between each string, right? Uh, just as an example. So that's list processing. <clears throat> um, I also know that there are 100 elements in my list. Uh, I can create a range. So a range in Python accepts a number, and it will create a generator of those 100 um, numbers which I can create a loop over, just like I did uh, a loop over the files directly. I can create a loop over these um, numbers instead. That will create a whole bunch of numbers. So I could index my files with that number as well. That, that will also work. And I'll get 100 um, elements of my files list, and I can print that. So that's a, another way of doing the same thing above, but now I've got like a, um, an iterator as well. Any ideas on how I could load up all of my images 
I've got the names of every image. Um, but how would I load each image? Let's see. So we, I know that I can get every string inside of this list of files. <clears throat> and I know that I can load an image by using this function imread, which takes the string, uh, which is the name of the file to load. So I could give it the actual string of each file by giving it that variable L and then setting that equal to another variable. So that now represents for each iteration of a loop that would represent that file's image. We can create a list of all of our images in Python by running, uh, by creating an empty list. So this is the syntax for an empty list here. And we can actually store each one of these images in this empty list by appending to it. This is more new syntax if you're unfamiliar with Python. Uh, and we'll see what this does right now. I'm going to run this. So it looks like nothing's happened, but we've actually loaded up 100 images right now, and we've stored them all into our list of images right here. And if I try to print out all of them, I'm going to get a whole mess of numbers. This is every single image now. Um, I can look at any one of the images by indexing that list, just like I've indexed um, the list before here, like I indexed a list of strings. Here now I'm indexing a list of images that have been loaded. So I can draw any one of these images as well using the I am show function. These are all different images, right? There's also shorthand versions of this, um, documented a uh, couple versions of this in the notebook. Um, we know that we can iterate over all of our files, either using this syntax or by saying for L in files, that's another way of doing it, and then writing a whole for loop, right? We can actually do this whole thing in one line of code in Python. Um, which often is a little easier to read, perhaps. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, it looks strange, but um, it's a lot less to look at, I think. So you can create this variable images by creating what's called a list comprehension. And list comprehensions work by writing for loops inside of the list. So rather than have this for loop and then we append each element to a list, we're actually going to write the for loop inside the list and then do something with each element in order to create each element of the list. So I can create a for loop for each element of my files. Um, and before that for loop is where the each element is created. And that's part of the syntax of this um, list comprehension. So I know that L represents a string. And uh, if I wanted to just recreate the same variable files, I could say L for L in files. That would iterate through every element of my files and create a new string and create a new list of all of those strings and set that equal to this variable. Or I could read every single string as an image using that function. And that would do the exact same thing as this bit of code. So now images is elements and each uh, image is a NumPy array. They're all, <clears throat> they can all be whatever shape each of these images are, right? So because this 
list of images are all the same size, we actually don't have to do <clears throat> anything clever in order to create an image data set out of this. Um, we can actually stack up all of our images into a larger array. Um, but the process I showed you before of cropping the image and then resizing it is really useful if you have many different types of image sizes. You won't be able to create a, an array that stacks all of your images into one larger array um, if they're all different sizes. And the way that we stack the images is by using this NumPy array function. So I'm going to create an image data set. At last, we're going to create an image data set. I'm going to call this images NP for NumPy. So before we had a list of images, now we're going to create a NumPy array of all of our images. We just say NumPy array images. And this variable now works just like one of our images worked, right? It has a shape, it has a data type. I can maybe draw it if Matplotlib knew how to draw 100 images. Um, but it has all the same kind of syntax that uh, the other NumPy arrays that we looked at have. So let's take a look at the shape. We've got 100 images of this size. All right, so in terms of this image shape, this is pretty nuanced. Like we've gone from a list of 100 images to this weird thing called a NumPy array, and that has created a new representation of all these images, right? Instead of having images in a list, now I've got images in a NumPy array. And the whole reason for doing this is so that we can do more clever things. Um, the Python lists can only do so many things, but in NumPy, we can do a lot of really fun stuff. Um, we can start to do machine learning with this. This is a data set. Right, um, so we can learn representations of it. We can put it into, you know, most algorithms that machine learning works with, like regression or classification, um, image generation, those sort of things. They will all more or less work with this type of rep representation at some point. So this is really the hardest part of machine learning, I think. Um, is getting your data set and getting it in the right format. All the other stuff, other people have figured out, right? Like, so you will find a GitHub maybe that does some algorithm, um, but it will use their own data. It'll use some other data set that you don't want to use. Uh, so this is really the hardest part, I think, of machine learning. And probably like 90% of the freelance work that I'll get is you know, trying to figure out how to get data into a machine learning algorithm. So this is hard, and we'll go through it a couple times. And um, it's it's all new syntax, so don't don't be discouraged. Give it some time, work through it. Um, go through the lectures again and um, the notebook that I've prepared. All right, but uh, moving on, uh, let's take a look at other ways of interrogating this data set that we've created. So um, just like the GIF that um, someone had created, Justin Sullivan, I think, um, in the slides, I forget who it was now, uh, just like the video of all the data of his products in, in different shopping malls and, uh, and grocery stores, like how could we start to visualize a data set like that? How can I start to understand what I've loaded? Um, right now, this is just, a bunch of numbers means nothing to me, but I want to know more about my data. Um, one way using this utils uh, module is to use this montage function. So inside utils, I provided a function called montage, and you can give it an image, which is um, shaped like this. 
So it needs to be the number of images, then the height, the row, the height by the width, and then um, color channels. So I'll give it images and p, and I'll set this equal to a variable. And um, this might not work. Right. So this is <clears throat> this is basically saying that um, your images aren't floating point values. And if you recall, previously, I recommended that we um, convert all of our images into floating point values. So if I try to look at this variables data type, it's, they're all unsigned integers. Um, and that's because I haven't done anything other than load this image. <clears throat> so all of the images are 8 bits. But I didn't apply that cropping and rescaling to each image, so it stayed 8 bits. And this montage function wants floating point um, images. So how could I redo what I've done here, but have each image be a floating point image? Uh, could you divide every element by 255? Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah. So where would I put that? So if, if I were to do it here, I could have it here and provide by 255. That will absolutely work. Um, so I could run that and look at my image in the same way. Uh, using the shorthand way, you can copy and paste more or less what you had here. So I could just divide 255 here. That will also work. Um, so each image should be still a NumPy array, should be the same shape. Uh, I should still be able to create a NumPy array of all of the images that were in, this, in that list. Except now, instead of uint8, I will have a floating point array of images. Another way um, is if this were loaded as 8-bit, so I didn't do this here, um, and I go through this again, and I get he to here, I can actually do a lot of things with NumPy arrays. I could also divide my NumPy array by eight. Just like this is a NumPy array, right? This is one image, but this is 100 images. It's the same operation. Right? Sorry, not 255. So rather than down, like, divide one image by 255, I could also divide all of the images by 255 here. Either way, um, that would work. So let's try this function again. So this returned a variable. This is a function that I had written, so I know how it works. And it basically has returned now this image that represents all of the images drawn as a large grid of all of the images. Um, so I can draw this just like I drew any other image. And it's it's really small, so it's a little hard to see. Um, I'm going to split this cell, which uh, there's some shortcut in Jupyter for this. It's control M minus. It's a really weird keyboard shortcut um, to split a cell like that. And so I can say plot that figure and give it a argument called fig size. And this takes um, inches in uh, rows and columns. So I can create a really large image like this. And this will draw the image into that figure. So it's, it'll appear much larger. Wait, sorry, how did you split the cell again? Yeah, it's, um, so you have to hit escape on the cell. So it can't be like you're typing into the cell. Um, it's definitely control, but you have to hit control N and while still holding control, then hit minus. That should be the way that works. Uh, so 
we've just seen how to draw a image a bit larger. Uh, we could also save this image uh, using IM save. And that takes a file name and the variable. This will be the full resolution of that variable. So this is way larger. So this is our data set from the celeb aligned data set, a subsampling of it at least. There's a, another module inside of this cattle repo, which is um, useful for image data sets. And that will allow you to build a um, GIF of all of your images. So we can say from cattle import the GIF submodule. And inside of here, there's a function called um, build. I have to input this first, and then I'll get some autocomplete. There's a function called build gif. And this has, as its first parameter, images, either a list or a numpy array. We have both. Um, and the interval, which is how many seconds in between each image, and then some other um, things. Uh, in order for this function to work, you actually have to install a Linux um, package. But we've seen how to do that. Uh, the Linux package you have to install is um, called image magic. So I'm just going to write that right here. And that's in the uh, notebook as well. So you will see those instructions. This this is basically a, a library that allows us to create GIFs. <clears throat> so if my runtime restarts, I'll have to redo all this, right? I'll have to reinstall Image Magic on that machine because it's it's like a fresh new computer, right? Each time. Um, so a little annoying, but that's if you want to create GIFs, then that's one way to work with that. Um, so this this function basically works by giving it a variable. I've got my images in a NumPy array. And I can give it some interval, which is like every uh, 20 times a second I want an image, let's say. And uh, that will save an image to this file called animation.gif. And it should appear here. We've got now a new file. We can take a look at it. So that's the GIF of all of those 100 images. All right, let's get started now with the last section. Um, we are going to be looking at taking our 100 images and calculating some basic statistics of it. Um, we've seen so far how to crop and resize an image in order to standardize its size. And in the case of the celeb data sets, we've seen how to load each of the images using a for loop or a Python list comprehension. And then using that list of images, we've seen how to create a NumPy array. Uh, with that NumPy array, we were able to run two different functions. We were able to create a montage with that um, NumPy array and look at all of the images. Uh, we were also able to create a GIF using um, the same library, um, but that required an additional Linux package that had to be installed, image magic. So using this variable, um, we're going to start to see how to do some other things, uh, calculating an average of all of our images. So if you recall from the slides, the average um, is a per pixel average. It's as if you had a translucent image for each of your images, and you set the alpha channel for each of your images so that they were equally weighted. And you're looking at some equal contribution of each of the images. 
um, when looking at the aggregate image. So in math, um, that's basically the mean operation. When you have um, a bunch of numbers and you want to look at the overall contribution for all of those numbers as a weighted sum, that's that's the mean or average, the same same idea. So recall that our variable has four dimensions, the number of images, the rows, the columns, and the color channels. So if I want to take the mean of all 100 images, um, what's the resulting shape that that should have? What, what size is my mean image going to be? It's not going to be 100 by 218 by 178 by three, but what am I taking the mean over? Like what values should I be summing over? And what's the resulting image size going to be? So I mentioned it's going to be a per pixel mean, which means that you can sort of imagine this like the pages of a book I've got 100 pages in my book, and right now I've, the book size is 218 by 178 with three color channels. And I want to look at the average of all of my pages. So I'm going to smear them all together, and I'm going to end up with one page, which represents the mean of all of those. That's what I'm trying to do with this mean operation. So I'm going to get rid of this dimension when I calculate my mean. And I'm going to end up with the dimensions of each image. Um, that's, that's going to be the resulting shape. So in NumPy, there are many statistical math operations you can do um, on a NumPy array. We've already seen one, which is dividing a NumPy array by 255. Effectively, what I'm going to try and do is create a mean of all of these images uh, by saying, you know, the zeroth image, I want to add to that the, the first image, and I want to add to that every single image up to and including the last image. And this will give me the sum of all of my images but then I have to divide by it the number of images that I have. And that's, that's, the formula for, that's the formula for a mean, right? Divided by, I know there are 100 images. So rather than try to add every single image individually, um, I can say numpy.mean. And this will take a any array and the axis for which to calculate the mean over. So I want the axis to be the axis which represents all of my images. This will effectively remove that dimension from my um, array and I'll be left with 218 by 178 by 3. So let's take a look at what that looks like. This is the mean of our 100 images um, with this operation, according to that operation. Any questions on that? What does the mean look like? It sort of looks like a generic kind of probably mostly white people in this data set. Um, perhaps some eyeshadow, darker hair. Um, the background is quite gray. Uh, all the faces are frontal facing. There's some variance here on the edges, um, mostly darker hair, some rosier cheeks perhaps. Uh, this is the center of this distribution. 
the mean that represents um, effectively where most of the images are likely to be. If I've got um, a different data set that's more variable, you'll see less structure in the mean of this image. You'll see um, what looks like more of this background part, right? If you recall from the slides presentation, we saw the means of many different types of distributions. Um, for the pedestrian street scene, for instance, we start to, to see more or less like textures and colors, but we didn't see anything as well defined as like facial features. We saw the outline of a pedestrian in the middle of the street. Um, so that, that points to effectively where is there structure in the data set. And another way of thinking of that structure is like, where is, what is the bias of this data set, right? If most of my data looks like this, that is another way of saying like, what does our data set represent? It mostly represents, according to the mean, it represents this type of image. So with machine learning, often the very first thing that a machine learning algorithm tries to learn is the mean because it represents most of the data. From there, it goes to try and find the deviations from the mean. So what do I mean by deviations? Imagine I gave you a set of numbers rather than a set of pixel values. Let's say my numbers were one, three, and five, the mean of these are three, right? That's if I add all of these up and divide by three, I should get back three, right? Um, I didn't try that math, but it doesn't actually work, does it? Oh, it does work, okay. So one plus three plus five equals nine. And I divide that by three and I'll get back three, right? So that's the middle of my distribution. The deviations are, um, so in this case, the mean equals three, right? The deviations are how far is each element from the mean? So for this element, if this was my second image and this was my third image, this element would represent the mean, right? That's that's like the ideal or I, like the center of my distribution of images. Whereas this one is a bit deviant, right? It's farther away from what the mean represents. So there's deviance in it in statistical terms. That's what we call uh, deviance. Uh, another word for that is there, it has a higher variance from the mean. Um, whereas this one is representative of the mean. Okay, so how can I start to visualize this variance? Like what, where are the likely, what are the pixels that are likely to change in my data set? Because that's what a machine learning is going to learn. Um, that's what a machine learning algorithm will learn. And we'll see next week actually how to visualize this as a plot, as a 2D plot with each image. But for, for this week, we're really just going to look at it as one image. So one of the ways that we can do this, that NumPy provides, just like they provide a mean operation, they provide a uh, standard deviation operation. So I can say, I'm going to create this variable um, image uh, right, you know, standing for standard deviation image. That's the name of my variable. And I'm going to call this function np.std. And uh, we can see the help for that here. Compute the standard deviation along the specified axis. And this works just like um, the mean function. So I can say here, give it the same variable and um, reduce the zeroth axis. And then I can draw this image 
like I drew the mean image. And this is a little harder to interpret, but what we're seeing here are in terms of standard deviations as an image, where is there likely to be change in the image? Um, because the standard deviation uh, is, is being taken on all three color channels, it's a little hard to visualize, like per red, per green, per um, blue, what the channel's um, deviations are. There's also other aspects of statistics, like there are most of the variants will fall under three standard deviations. Um, so these are just some details of machine learning. Uh, but if I multiply this by three, I actually see more representation of what the true deviance of the entire data set looks like. So in general, I see higher values across all color channels for our background, which makes sense. Like the backgrounds in every image are very different, right? So I'm seeing a higher value for my standard deviation represented by um, uh, all white pixels. That's the higher values go from black to white um, in, in this image representation. Lower values are going to be darker. Uh, so that's what we're seeing here is like the, the faces mostly are similar, but then as we get away from the faces, there's more and more change happening in the image. So we're looking at this for every color channel I mentioned, which means that the shape of this is actually, you know, has color channels in it. But we could look at the change across all color channels too by looking at the mean across all color channels. Maybe it doesn't make sense to look at this um, per color channel. So another way to look at the deviation of all of our images is to um, average the change across all of the color channels. So we can look at the mean, uh, let's call this one grayscale. Uh, so we're going to look at the grayscale version of our standard deviation effectively by taking the mean of our three channel standard deviation and reducing the second axis. So this is the zeroth axis, the first axis, and then the second axis. Let's take a look at this. Remember when we plotted our grayscale image before that this is using a color map. So this is the Viridis color map, which is um, recognized as being quite good for colorblind uh, folks. And if we want to look at this as a grayscale image, we can also, just like we did before. So this is a, another way of visualizing our standard deviations for that data set. It's all really quite technical and um, I imagine that this is very like reference material that you can come back to. I don't expect anyone to, um, you know, grasp all of statistics in a lab, you know, but um, at least have access to this code and know how to use it again and have some basic intuition on it. Um, I think that's important. What do you think is being represented here? What if um, I give this a different data set? Um, let's try and look at the same process now, but for a totally different type of data set. And I want to do something a little fun with the remaining 10 minutes. I'm going to blow by this, but you'll have this in your reference material. And um, your homework will be basically to create your own image data set. So you'll have to find your own way of getting images into a notebook. 
uh, either downloading images from the web or uploading them or mounting a Google Drive where you've already um, drag and drop the files into a Google Drive or um, any other way that you can imagine. Uh, then you'll have to calculate the data set's mean and standard deviations, and you'll have to visualize the data set as well. So you can use one of the methods that we've um, shown here by creating the larger montage or by creating a GIF. Um, if you have other ways of visualizing the data set, that's totally fine as well. I'd be really curious to see what um, you come up with. and. There's a bit of code as well in the notebook for sorting images, and um, I will I'll take a look at that real quickly as well um, right now. I think yeah, let's take a look at that really quickly. So I mentioned with this example up here of when I was writing out these numbers. So let's say that each pixel had a value of like one image had a pixel with the value of one, another one had a pixel, the value was three, and the, another image had the pixel value of five. And let's say the mean for that pixel ended up being three. Um, so these are already sorted based on the mean. Um, but let's say, you know, the five was here, and there was a, th a three here, and another one here. Um, Again, the mean is still three of this sequence, but they're not sorted in terms of um, order. What does it mean to find a representation for an image data set according to a machine learning algorithm? One way to think of that is as deviation from the mean. So if this image represents something about this data set, then I can sort all of my images based on that representation. Whatever this representation is saying, I can look at every other image in my data set based on its distance to that image. So that's what we're going to look at right now. It's um, a way of thinking about this axis of representation created by the mean. And this is the first thing that any machine learning algorithm tries to learn is it tries to learn what's called in um, statistics, the principal component. That's what we're learning right now. It's a super advanced topic, um, but it can look quite cool and it can produce some very interesting uh, animations if you find representations of your data set that actually represent something that you want to build a story out of, for instance. In the case of these faces, I think it's um, quite interesting for really biased data sets primarily to see how most of the image data set can look a certain way. And um, it really kind of pinpoints where there's issues of um, um, bias in a data set. So how do we get to this point of calculating the distance for every element in our data set from that mean? and then sorting our images based on that. Well, we can create um, a list of all of our distances. So I'm going to create an empty list, which is going to store all of our distances. Then I'm going to loop over all of my images. So for i in range length of images, I know there's 100, but you know this is, oops. This is just going to be um, uh, a list for 0 to 100. Then what I can do is I can say, well, I, I have my mean image up here, right? And I can index every image in my NumPy array with this i. And I, I know that that's the same shape as my mean image. So I can just subtract it, really. And that will subtract every image from my mean. I could even store all of these and look at the average of them and visualize them. And that's actually the exact same thing as the standard deviation. Um, but what I want to do is store the distances. So I'm going to append all of these values. Uh, 
I can even directly just store the sum of all of these values. It's another way to do it, or even the mean. All of these work. There are all different ways of sorting the data set uh, based on that mean. They all lead to really different representations. So now I've got an array of distances. Some are quite close to the mean, like this one. Some are very far from the mean, right? Some again are quite close to the, the mean and some are quite far. So what I want to do is visualize all of my images based on this distance from the mean. What I will do is use this array that I've just created, this list, sorry. <coughs> Num, uh, numpy arrays and Python lists. I have a Python list in distances. I'm going to sort that first and create a new variable called indexes. So I sort this by using np.argsort. And this is basically going to say what's the order of um, the sorting for that array of distances. These are all the indexes that would sort it. This would be the lowest value, I guess. I can look at that. This is the lowest value. And then this would be the highest value. So now I can recreate my list of images based on this index list, and then revisualize that as a GIF or a montage and see how does my data set compare to the mean? How, how does every single image you know, compare to that mean? What is the most deviant image? And what is the most um, representative image of that um, mean? So I'll create another variable called sorted. I will uh, index my images. I can index my 8-bit images or my NumPy images, um, whichever. Um, for each element, my indexes list. And then I can draw this again. Uh, draw it. It's very small. Let's make it bigger. So I'll leave you to ponder what that's done and think about that, especially in relation to your um, homework, because you'll have to do the same thing with your own data set. But um, have a think about what representation did this uh, model, let's call this a model. It's a very simple model, but it is a machine learning model. And uh, let's think about what the, what did this model learn? Like, what is this data set capable of representing, um, if anything? All right, um, I think we're out of time, but I wanted to show you one other thing. Um, yeah, I'll show you, I'll just show you a bit of code and not really explain it, but it will be in the notebook. Um, this is code to extract images from a movie from YouTube. And this could be a fun way to collect data. Um, you can hopefully use copy left videos um, from YouTube and uh, extract still frames from that video and create a data set out of that. So this is the code. <laughs> It's mostly Linux. Um, here we're installing something called FFmpeg. We actually saw that command before and it's actually already installed, so that's not necessary. Uh, this is the fun one. This is installing a Python library called YouTube-DL. It's also a, a, a command line application and it just takes the URL of a video. Uh, that will download a video. Um, I'm now uh, creating 
Uh, I'm removing a folder called movie in case it already existed. It, it doesn't exist. But here I'm creating a movie folder. And then I'm using this application called FFmpeg <clears throat> uh, on the video that I've just downloaded here. And with some syntax from FFmpeg, I'm basically creating a bunch of images from that movie file. So if I run all this, I will get a bunch of images from that YouTube video, which I can repeat most of what I've done in this notebook and create the mean standard deviation of and uh, montage a GIF um, and sort it. And you can do this for multiple YouTube videos. Um, if they're different sizes, then you should crop and resize them and then combine them, right? So that is more or less what you'll have to do for your homework. It doesn't have to be a YouTube video. You could have your own images from your photo collection that you want to um, store on your Google Drive and then demonstrate like what, what that data set represents as you calculate the mean and standard deviation and sort of. Uh, 